Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we start a new series on Earth systems. Topic for the day is going to be earthquakes, so like always, let me get you some objectives and we'll get going. So by the end of this video, two things that I need you to know or be able to do. First one is to explain the formation of the Earth and describe its structure. Second one is to explain the causes of earthquakes and volcanoes. Now, before I get into this, um, I'll note that you should probably go over and watch the plate tectonics video also because plate tectonics will talk to you about the mechanics that cause a lot of the things that we're going to talk about today. So you should probably watch the two of these together. But I want to go ahead and start out with um, theories on the formation of the Earth. So I'm just going to talk you through the currently most accepted model of the formation of the Earth. Recognize there are several out there, but this is one that most scientists use and go by. So let me just kind of take you on a step-by-step -step journey through it. Thought is, at the beginning of the universe, you had the Big Bang and cosmic dust went flying out all over the place. Now, as particles come close to each other, they are attracted to one another because every atom has gravity. So when you get atoms together, they start to kind of be attracted to each other because of gravity. And the bigger something is, the more gravity it has. So what we see is over time, as the particles from the Big Bang start to cool off, they slow down, they're not moving as quickly. And as they slow down, they start to get near to one another. As they get near to one another, they start to clump together. And as they clump together, they have more gravity, which attracts more dust, and all of these uh, particles that are clumping together start to coalesce and start to rotate. And as they rotate, the particles and the gases, they start to come together more and more solidly until finally you end up with a situation like this. The first thing that would have come together likely would have been our sun. And so all of the hydrogen and helium that formed our sun clumped together, and that being the biggest object in our solar system, it kind of became the center of the solar system. So everything started to rotate around that, held in by the gravity of the sun. And then over time, all of the other particles clumped together, forming the planets now. One, two, three, Earth would be right there in the solar system. Um, so the basic thought is that as those gases and particles and elements cooled down and coalesced together, they formed the Earth. And the consequence of that is that the Earth is kind of divided into layers. Um, as the Earth cooled, the heavier elements sank down towards the center of the Earth, while the lighter elements ended up on the outside. So this is why scientists think that the core of the Earth is probably really heavy elements like iron and nickel, and relatively light elements like, I don't know, silicon and oxygen are out in the crust. And so the idea is that as the Earth cooled down, all of the elements settled out into uh, layers, which is why the Earth has the layered appearance that it currently does. So if we could chop the Earth in half, this is what scientists think we would probably find. And this right here is to scale. Interesting thing. The crust of the Earth that we live on is extremely thin. If you were to compare it to an apple, chop an apple in half, the thickness of the skin around the outside of that, that apple is roughly comparable to how thick the crust of the Earth is in comparison to the rest of the Earth. So on the crust, you've got the lithosphere, which is the part of the Earth that we walk on. So this would be the lithosphere right here, also known as the crust. It is the rocky outer layer. Underneath the crust, you have got the asthenosphere. The asthenosphere is mostly liquid molten magma. Underneath the asthenosphere, you've got the mantle, which the mantle is kind of like, it's not liquid, it's not rock, it's somewhere in between. It's said to be plastic, which means that it is moldable and malleable. So this is going to be rock that is hot enough to be movable, but is not liquid enough to be the asthenosphere. Um, the lithosphere rides around on top of the asthenosphere as the Earth goes through the process of continental drift. And then underneath the upper mantle, you've got the lower mantle. And then below that, you've got an outer core and an inner core. So this is basically the structure of the Earth. Like I said, as all of those elements cooled down and coalesced to form the Earth, the heavier stuff sank down towards the center. So iron, nickel, heavy stuff down that down here, and the lighter elements ended up on the outside. And it is the pressure of all of this weight pressing in on the Earth that keeps the core of the Earth to be solid, even though it is extremely hot. Now, 
some of the consequences of plate movement, like we talked about in our other video, um, some of the major consequences of plate movement are the following. Um, <laughs> evolution, in large part, is a consequence of plate movement. So let's say, for example, we start out with groups of animals living here on Pangaea, all of the continents together. Over time, as those plates drift apart, some animals are going to get stuck on this plate, some are going to get stuck on these, some on this one, I don't know, some on this one. And as those plates drift to dis different parts of the Earth, their climates are going to change, which means that the animals that are on those climates are going to have to evolve to meet the climate that that uh, continent has drifted into. So it's thought that uh, continental drift is one of the driving forces behind evolution. Um, obviously, you've got volcanoes and earthquakes. I'm going to talk about volcanoes and earthquakes in just a second. Just associate them with a consequence of continental drift. All right, let's talk a second about earthquakes, one of the major consequences of the fact that the plates of the earth are moving around all the time. You can kind of in your head think about the surface of the earth being like an eggshell, and then you bang that egg on the counter and it cracks. That's kind of what our earth is like. The crust of the earth, that lithosphere, is cracked and broken up into plates, and they're riding around on the asthenosphere, always bumping and jostling against one another. And what will happen is two plates will start sliding past one another, and as they slide, they will get stuck. So let's say that there are some rocks in between these two plates. So let's say we got plate one right here, plate two right here, plate one is sliding this way, plate two is sliding this way. As they slide, they will occasionally get caught. So let's say that there's some rock right here joining the two plates together, and the two plates can't move because these rocks are holding them together. The problem is the plates will keep trying to move, so pressure is going to build up on this spot until finally that spot, those rocks in that area, just breaks, it ruptures, it falls. And when that happens, shock waves are sent out in all directions through the Earth. Now, a couple of terms that you need to know. The place where the break actually occurs, right here, this is known as the focus. I got foci because an earthquake can have multiple focuses. But the focus is the place where the break actually happens. If you draw a line from there, straight up to the surface of the Earth. Wherever the place on the surface of the Earth is that's directly above the focus, that is the epicenter. And then the last thing is a fault. This area along which the break occurs is the fault. So that's some basic terminology for you on earthquakes. And also with earthquakes, you need to know about the Richter scale. The Richter scale is a scale for measuring how much the surface of the Earth moves during an earthquake, so how much movement do those shock waves cause. It also uh, kind of measures the damage that is done. So a couple things to know about it is that it is a logarithmic scale, just like our pH scale. If you remember pH scale, if you go from one number to the next, it's a movement of 10. Same with the Richter scale. So right here we can say that a earthquake with a Richter scale rating of 1 is insignificant. 2 also insignificant. You're probably not going to feel either one of those. Once you get to a 3, you can start feeling the earthquake. 4, you start moving some cabinets and doing some damage. By the time you get to 5, you are shaking buildings pretty good. 6, things are falling over. 7, you start getting some damage. 8, you get something like the tsunami in Japan and the earthquake in Haiti. 9, places are getting leveled. And 10, there's not much left. And if you wanted to compare these one to the other, you could say that a 4 is 10 times stronger than a 3. And if you remember, this goes by 10s. So if we are going to compare a 4 to a 2, then it's times 10 again. So you could say that a 4 is 100 times more powerful, not percent, 100 times more powerful than a 2. Or you could say that an 8 is 10 times 10 times 10, so an 8 is 1,000 times more powerful than a 5. Make sure that you are able to do conversions within the scalar to make comparisons. And this is where I'm going to finish up. Last slide for the day. Another consequence of the fact that the plates move around past each other are volcanoes, because we talked about that asthenosphere is liquid molten magma underneath the Earth. Um, at those boundaries where the plates meet, there are cracks, and that magma can rise up through those cracks, causing volcanoes. Um, also, as the plates slide past each other, um, they melt and come back up through and cause volcanoes. Now, obviously, 
when you have a volcanic eruption, there are a lot of problems. You get gas and ash that's thrown into the air. There's a lot of particulate pollution. Um, there was an eruption in Iceland in 2010 that shut down air traffic in Europe for, I don't know, I think close to a week. Um, obviously, lava flows do a big problem. They can burn down forest. Um, when a volcano goes off, you can get mudslides. You can get pyroclastic flow, which is other stuff flowing down the mountain. You get toxic gases. So there's a lot of stuff that goes along with a volcano. While I'm talking about consequences of disasters, I should probably talk about earthquakes. Um, with earthquakes, a couple of things that you need to know about is in an earthquake, most people are killed by falling buildings. So if you live in an area like Japan where building codes are pretty up to date, um, buildings are supposed to be built such that they can withstand an earthquake, you don't have very many deaths during an earthquake. But if you go somewhere like Haiti where the building codes do not meet earthquake standards, the buildings aren't built very well. If there is an earthquake, it could do a whole lot of damage because the you know buildings will fall over. Other problems associated with earthquakes is you can get contaminated water if say sewer lines rupture or if waste is uh, flows into waterways. Um, you can get mudslides, you can get landslides. So there are a lot of problems that go along with both of these and I think that is it. I, um, if you go back to this video, make sure that you understand the terminology around earthquakes and volcanoes. Also make sure that you are able to use that Richter scale and that you can describe the formation of the earth and why lighter elements are found on the surface of the earth while heavier elements are found down towards the middle. So thank you for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite. Hopefully we'll see you again.